Hey, listen, here's the thing. We, we don't want anyone leaving here uh, having not received the most important gift of all, which is the Lord himself. So here's what we want to do. We want to identify two things, and we're going to be brief, okay, just, a, just about 45 minutes. I'm going to teach for 45 minutes. No, just kidding. We're going to be brief, but the objective is this. We're going to underscore the fact that God came to meet us, which is what Christmas is all about. But there comes a time in each one of our lives that the Lord Jesus comes to meet you. Now, the question is, what, what does that look like? We're going to look at a life of a woman that Jesus initiated relationship with her. We're going to identify the nuts and bolts that took place in her life that will give us correct understanding of what it looks like when Jesus Christ comes to meet you. I mean, what does that look like? Because here's the thing. I really believe that's what's going to take place tonight in many hearts and many lives that are here. And it's so important to make the distinction, especially at this time of year, because this is a very unique time, right? I mean, it's really a mixed bag between fact and fiction. You know, you have fairy tales, you have traditions, and then you have the first Christmas, which of course, you know, identifies the greatest real reality of all, which is Almighty God revealed himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I got to tell you, this is the time where you can have these wires cross, and it's just, it's a little confusing. It kind of reminds me of this couple who were celebrating their 70th wedding anniversary, and the husband said to his wife, honey, I just want you to know that your love has been tried and true all these years. She said, what did you say? He said, I always want you to know your love has been tried and true. She said, what did you say? Your love has been tried and true. She said, I'm tired of you too. You know, it's like <laughs> wires crossed, right? I mean, here's the thing. I, I grew up in the South Bay. I did not come from a religious family. So it was like all about the fairy tales, it was all about the tradition, it was all about Santa, and I was so into it. I mean, I was one of those kids, I remember it. I walked out, you know, Christmas Eve, I looked up in the sky, I could, I could have swore I saw Santa, swore I saw Rudolph, you know, in the blinking nose and stuff. Little did I know, our house was in a flight pattern of LAX at the time, you know, but I was just so into it. And not to be ridiculous, but we all know the, like, the four stages of Christmas. You know, you believe in Santa, then you don't believe in Santa. Then you are Santa, you know. And then you look like Santa, you know, all these things. Okay, those are the jokes. That's it. That's, they're done, right? But on a more serious note, here's the thing. There's a lot of pressure at this time of year and, um, and, 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 and depression even because there is an attempt to relive the past. One newspaper said when calls to the psychiatrist and emergency room visits are tally the increase is always evident the holiday fantasy in which today's festivities never measure up to the romanticized image of christmas past cambridge hospital psychiatrist lesson haven said the older persons uh, the holidays get harder because it gets increasingly difficult to hold on to great expectations so here's what ends up happening look we all have a childhood right and I'm assuming many of us grew up with Santa Claus and those type of traditions and things. And you have certain things triggered when you are a child. You have a sense of wonderment. You have a sense of transcendence that, you know, we are a part of something bigger than uh, ourselves, right? And then as we get older, it's very difficult to recapture those feelings, especially when it's not replaced with the first Christmas especially when it's not replaced with the real thing. C.S. Lewis said, all the things that ever deeply possessed your soul has been but hints of heaven. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy, but to arouse it to suggest the real thing. Now here's, here's phenomenal news. The Bible tells us, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, I think we have up on the screen, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's really good news. So in other words, we can actually know today the Jesus of yesterday. You can actually experience tonight the Jesus of yesterday. And if you experience uh, tonight the Jesus of yesterday, today you will experience him all throughout eternity. That is the most phenomenal deal that there is. This means 
that the Jesus of yesterday can actually be known. So I want to put another scripture up on the screen. And in fact, if we put this on a, like on a scale that weighed the truth, it would just knock off the scale like crazy. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is, can someone tell me, Christ the, can someone tell me, Lord. Okay, now that is incredible, like off the charts. And, and that was actually told to shepherds, by the way. An angel declared that to shepherds outside of the city of Bethlehem. Shepherds at that particular time were not the most respected in that culture. And it gives us some great insight to the Bible because if someone were to try to con the story or to try to pawn off the story of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, it, it wasn't true, but they're trying to, you know, it was a con and they were trying to persuade people that it really happened but it didn't really happen they would never have chosen shepherds to be the one to have heard the announcement of jesus's birth there's just no way maybe you would have made up the story there's some prince or princess on their way to egypt and an angel appeared and then they went to bethlehem and then they you know saw the messiah and so forth but the bible tells us the truth I mean, it's one of the evidence that, in fact, it is the Word of God. And, of course, let's just break this down. I mean, you have City of David. Well, that is Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. There's a great prophecy that addressed the coming of Jesus. Prophecies identifying future events before they happen. So that when they happen, it might speak of the fact that God has communicated to us. We have it up on the screen. Bethlehem, out of you shall come forth. To me, the one to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. In fact, that word everlasting could be translated to the vanishing point, time out of mind. Here's what's being said. The Bible prophesied that the uncreated one, the eternal one, the one that was never made, was never created, it's always been, the one that we can't even wrap our mind around because he is eternal, would reveal himself in the city of Bethlehem. How many of you are tracking on that point? That is just like off the charts. Here's the alternative. Uh, if there is not an uncreated one, an eternal one, if there's not a first mover of all things, then all of us are merely a byproduct of mindless nature. The birth of Jesus speaks to us of how God came down to meet us, how God has revealed himself. And note that this one born in the city of David is identified as a savior. A savior speaks of one who helps outside of ourselves, who brings wholeness and healing and makes things right. But check this out. This savior is identified as Christ, which means Messiah, anointed one. And he's identified as the Lord, which is not a title. It is identifying the nature of who he is. So it's telling us, again, coinciding with Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that you have the uncreated one, the eternal one, who has revealed himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has come to bring a rescue. Do we need a rescue? I mean, do we need a Savior? Do we really? I mean, ask yourself, has the age of technology and science and accumulation of knowledge and the global community in which we live have these things really answered the big issues of life? Has it answered the question of why we exist? Has it answered the emptiness of man and death and hopelessness? I mean, we, we live in the age of science, but science, it simply identifies how things work. Science doesn't answer why you exist. It doesn't tell us the truth about Almighty God. Actress, Angelina Jolie said, I remember one of the most upsetting times in my life was after I had attained success, financial stability, and I was in love, and I thought, I have everything that I should have to be happy, but I am not happy, she said. Actor Matt Dillon said, you need something to fill the emptiness. It can be another person and drugs, prestige, or whatever. I've tried those things. They just don't do the trick. You know what? We're really not all looking for um, Christmas in truth. That's not what we're really looking for. We're looking for Christ. You know, it's not, we're not really looking for gifts. We are looking for the giver. 
We're not really looking for merriment. We're looking deep down inside for the Messiah. And what's incredible is that today we can all experience the Jesus of yesterday because he is the same today and forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. Now the question is, I mean, what does it look like to actually have an experience with the Lord Jesus? And this is where I want to get to the story. It's recorded in John chapter 4. And it tells the story of Jesus meeting a Samaritan woman. He initiates relationship with her. He initiates communication with her, I should say. She has come to a well in the afternoon, which is a bit odd because generally the gals got the water in the morning. So it tells us a little bit about the social standing of this particular woman. And to kind of paraphrase it for time's sake, Jesus initiates this conversation. She is astonished that a Jew would actually communicate to her publicly. I mean, in that culture, it's hard for us to wrap around. Men did not speak to women publicly unless it was like your mom or your wife or your sister or your daughter. And for a, an Orthodox Jew to communicate to a non-Jew publicly was like scandalous. And Jesus asked if, you, if she could get him some water and... And um, she's just blown away by this. And so they have this conversation and kind of speeding up the story a little bit. Uh, Jesus says to her, why don't you go get your husband? Okay, this is kind of moving on in the story. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. Now check this out. <laughs> he goes, that's right. You don't have a husband. Um, and you have had five husbands. And the one that you are presently living with is not your husband. Now, let's just pause here for a second. Is that not a little awkwardly real or what? Right? I mean, he initiates this conversation. They talk about water. He ends up talking about, if you know who I was, I could give you water that you drink of. You'll never thirst again. And then says, you know, could you go get your husband? Says, I don't have a husband. Yeah, you've had five husbands. And she's just like blown away by this, that he sees her past, he sees her for who she is. Now, here's the thing about this. Is this gal drops her water pot, goes into the city, and she is totally ecstatic. She's telling everyone, come and meet the person who's told me everything that I did. Now, wait a second. It's like, why would she be so happy about that? I mean, it's like, you know, telling of such a past and, I mean, a lot of pain and all those relationships and stuff. And, and here's where we get to see what it looks like when you begin to meet Jesus Christ. Because he not only identifies you for who you are, which can be at times painful or where you've been, which can be at times painful, but at the same time, he absolutely gives you the assurance that he loves you. This is, this is a woman who not only saw herself in his eyes and saw the truth about herself, that she knew everything, uh, he knew everything about her, but she had the confidence that Jesus loved her. Let me tell you, one of the greatest fears in life is to be known, but not loved. Okay, so it's like, okay, what does it look like to meet Jesus Christ? Well, for one, he sees us for who we are. But in addition to that, at the very same moment, he is affirming that he loves us. Can I hear a big amen to that? Or... It's awesome news. Here's the thing. I wonder what he would say to you. You know, I wonder if there would be kind of this awkward realness. You know, awkwardly real that Jesus would get with you and why would that be so important because tonight let me just say he wants to get awkwardly real with you and I'll tell you why because he totally loves you and God's love is fiercely selfless it's intrinsically good it influences to protect and to nourish and let me tell you about Jesus love Jesus actually hates anything in your life that would hurt you or undermine your highest good. And he wants you to see that there are certain dangerous influences 
in your life that he has come to protect you from. He wants you to see yourself for who you really are. Why? Well, because he is perfect love and he has come to give right relationship to you. He has come to protect you from these dangerous influences. Now, here's the thing. We don't have an accurate view of who we are by self-diagnosis. We need help outside of ourselves. You ever got on Google before and kind of try to self-diagnose a medical condition? You know, doctors say, don't do that. It could really mess you up, right? But if you really want an accurate view of yourself, you need help outside of yourself. Maybe a friend could help you with that. A loved one, a spouse, and better yet, the Lord himself. So here's the thing. Bear with me. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. The Bible says, you shall have no other gods before me. God created us. He knows what's best for us. He gave us instructions for life. And the first one is that we're to have the right allegiance for life. If our allegiance is thrown off, it throws everything else off in our life. It's like the vertical relation of our life is thrown off. Though Everything on the horizontal plane is messed up. And the question you need to ask yourself, well, has there ever been any person, place, or thing that has dethroned Almighty God in my life, has messed that loyalty and allegiance up. Listen, that is more serious than you could ever imagine. That's, that's dangerous. That's called sin. Exodus 20, verse 4, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind. It's another way of saying you should not create a God out of the figment of your imagination. Being sincere about what you believe is not enough. You can be sincerely wrong. The Bible says you shall not murder, but Jesus said murder begins in the heart. If I look upon another human being, you know, less than creating the image of God, black trash, Jewish trash, Arab trash, Hispanic trash, Asian trash, I just wish they were dead. I mean, that's murder. Because who we really are is who we are from the inside out. And when our lives are diagnosed, it reveals a deadly problem. The Bible says whoever keeps the whole law, and yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death to inner life. Death to dreams. Death to relationships. It's like when God made our body down to the cellular level, um, well, it is to run in accordance to how he programmed it. If it goes outside of original design, it's called cancer. If we go outside of original design of how he created us, it creates a terrible mess. And sooner you see your condition, the sooner you'll see the Savior, Christ the Lord. And that means you're closer to the chief purpose that God made you, which is to have a relationship with you. Can I hear another amen to that? That is so true. And that's what he wants. Listen, I believe the Lord has you here tonight that you might know him, that you might experience him, that you might leave here with the assurance that your sins are forgiven? Because let me tell you, when Jesus was on the cross, he made this incredible statement. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was quoting a prophecy, Psalm 22. He knew the answer to that question. On the cross, he was bearing the sin of the entire world. He was bearing the addiction. He was bearing the, the emptiness. He was bearing the racism. He was bearing, bearing all the brokenness that exists from being outside of original design. The Bible says he was being treated as if he committed every stinking sin in human history. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knew the answer to that. He knew the answer. He was being forsaken there on the cross bearing our sin, your sin, and mine, so that you and I wouldn't be forsaken. He was taking our loneliness. He was taking our addictions. He was taking our pain upon himself. Look at this verse. We're almost done here. Isaiah chapter 53. I love this. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are, can we all say it? Healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. 
We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Man, there is not a more powerful narrative than a love rescue that someone would give their life for another. You know, the Bible says that God demonstrated his love towards us, but we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. He loves you. Listen, he loves you. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you enough not to leave you the way you are. He made you to know him. Deep down inside, that is what you are longing for. You are longing for a relationship with the heavenly father in Christ. And he's fighting for your life. Be careful. Because you have an all-knowing, powerful, and just God that can really do everything anything he wanted to do except deny his own nature and contradict it. And, and also, he cannot move the heart that hardens against him. And that's why the Bible says he hates pride. Pride is a superiority complex, a poison that keeps millions of people from Jesus. The Bible says pride comes before the fall. Look, look, the Lord loves you. He's knocking on the door of your heart. He's seeking entrance. Deep down inside, it is he you are longing for. He made you to know him. That's what Christmas is all about. He came to meet us. And I believe tonight, the Lord is coming to meet many of you here tonight. And I am telling you, you can leave here with Christ in your heart. Can I hear another big amen to that? Amen. amen. Let's pray at this time. Let's pray, you guys. And Marty's going to come back out. Let's pray. And I'm going to just ask the church family to be in an attitude of prayer. You say, Greg, what do I do with that message? Well, number one, recognize what he's done for you. Not only made us, but he's revealed himself to us. He's reached out to us. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except to be through me. And he proved it by resurrecting from the dead. He is alive and he's here in this room. And whether you're 15 or 75, you're not too young, you're not too old to recognize the greatest truth of all by the help of God's Spirit. And number two, it's critical that you repent, which means to change the way you think there to be a moment in time in your life that you embrace Jesus Christ. And I believe for many of you, that's tonight. And then number three, to receive him. He really is just a prayer away. A prayer to say, Lord, come into my life and be my Savior, be my Lord, be my God. And then finally, do it now. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. The Bible says, if you hear the voice of God, harden not your heart. So just while our heads are bowed, please, and our eyes are closed, how many of you would say, Greg, you know, tonight, I want to settle my eternity with the Lord. I, I want to settle right relationship with him. I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior. Let me tell you something. That can take place on a drop of a dime. I mean, you can snap your finger. And, Actually, right standing with the Lord is like the miracle in the moment. He wants to give you himself, but you must come to him on his terms. And that's through his son. And if you would like to do that, just while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I just want you to raise up your hand right now. And I'm going to pray for you. Just slip up your hand all over this thing. Just God bless you and God bless you and God bless you and God bless you. You're not going to be the only one. If you're thinking, man, that's me. I, I'd like to receive Christ. Awesome. Because I believe the Lord has you here to do just that. If you haven't already, you just ready, ready, raise your hand. You just raise your hand. Now, let me just see. It's hard for me to see in a setting. God bless you. I see your hand in the back. How about in the front, the middle, the side? God bless you guys. I see you. Awesome. God bless you in the back. There are many. And maybe... You know, you're saying, Greg, I came tonight, Christmas concert, and there was a time I was walking with the Lord, but I really need to recommit my life to him. And, you know, if that's you, you raise your hand as well. Let me pray for you. God bless you. Listen, those of you that raised your hand, I, I want you to stand up right where you're seated. Seriously, stand up right where you're seated. Stand. There's something powerful about taking a stand. 
Put, that's in, put some legs to your faith. Awesome. All over the place. God bless you. God bless you. There's others. You stand. I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. Our precious Lord hung, bled, gave his life publicly for us. He said if we confess him before men, he'll confess us before the Father which is in heaven. Isn't that not awesome or what? Anybody else? You stand. Anybody else in the back, in the front, if you'd like to receive Christ, take your stand tonight. Anybody else? God bless you in the back, each of you. Wonderful. I'd like for you who are standing to pray with me, and this is a prayer to ask Christ to be your Savior and Lord. So pray this prayer out loud with me. Lord Jesus, I call upon you now to be my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for dying for me and paying the debt of my sin. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. I turn to you tonight as Lord and Savior. Thank you that you hear me. Thank you that you've come into my life and that you've made me your child. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.